Okay. okay? Excellent. So, I think this is a really interesting topic. Um, uh, I'm an emergency, trained as an emergency medicine doc, went here to the University of Colorado, trained at Denver Health when it was still called the Dog House. And thank you for remembering. <laughs> Um, and ended up at Lutheran and now at Good Samaritan Hospital. So I'm still, I still have an active full practice at both of those emergency departments. Um, so how did I end up at Arapahoe House? Um, I'm also the medical director for Pride Mart, which became Real Metro, which became AMR. So it's the ambulance service that carts folks from detox to Lutheran to detox to Lutheran. And I thought I had this naive idea that I could somehow interfere in that traffic. And that was nine or eight, eight or nine years ago. That didn't happen, but I'm still at Arapaho House. Um, so I, I got this project kind of late, so I'm going to apologize first because the card deck is big, and I am going to stray from it, but there's an accurate one that's available uh, at email, in the email. I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have a question, just ask it any time. We'll wander back to the card deck. Um, learning objectives, identify the current evidence-based medicine around substance abuse in the acute care setting. And by acute care, I initially thought primary care, but really it's more, for this group, I think more acute emergency hospital-based. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So who's, who, you're, most of you are nurses. Um, who is in the emergency department? Anybody? ICU? Surgical floors? Uh -huh. Hi. Um, outpatient settings? Okay, excellent. So I'm going to try to touch on a little bit everywhere. So this is going to be kind of a, a, a bit of an interesting dance. Um, learn the overlapping spectrum of medical conditions and substance use disorders. I want to try to give a large, a broad format framework within which to think about this. Um, identify some appropriate testing for diagnosis and withdrawal and a little bit of, about management techniques. And we're going to do that in 37 minutes so there's time for questions at the end. Oh, so... As I'm talking, as I'd like you to be thinking, so a couple nights ago, um, kid comes in, 14 years old, tachycardic, eyes wide, um, confused, has trouble talking, has trouble walking, and that's his presentation. So just sort of think about this kid that comes in altered, not lateralizing neurologically. He can walk. He's moving his arms and legs. He's poorly coordinated. He's stammering. Blood pressure is fine, lie down, heart rate's normal, stand up, heart rate triples, doubles, up to the 150, 170. So think about this presentation just as broadly as you can as we go through a bunch of this stuff. The nomenclature has changed. Should I skip a slide? No. So the nomenclature has changed. DSM-4 has changed um, from how we used to discuss substance abuse substance use, withdrawal syndromes, all of that's kind of out. Now they've really reorganized all of it so that we talk about um, substance use disorder and substance use uh, induced sim uh, syndromes. And they've added a, a order um, all by its uh, addictive disorders gambling. So there's substance use disorders that used to previously been split into abuse or dependence. It's a continuum of disease. Um, and that involves impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and pharmacologic criteria. And then there's a separate category, substance-induced disorders, of which withdrawal is part of that spectrum. So substance use disorders, patterns of behavior related to these particular disease, and induced disorders can be um, a result. It can be the, simply intoxication, it can be withdrawal, or it can be any of the longer term sequelae from that, including mental health disorders and cognitive problems. So they've lumped them into two large and broad categories. 
We have 10 classes that are recognized. Alcohol, caffeine is not recognized. Cannabis, hallucinogens, inhalants, opioids, the set of the hypnotics and anxiolytics are lumped together. Stimulants are lumped together. Tobacco is now on here. Um, and then gambling is a separate category altogether. The diagnostic criteria, um, we'll just run through them real quick. Using larger amounts or for a longer time than intended, persistent desire or unsuccessful attempts to cut down or control craving, a great deal of time is spent obtaining, using, or recovering, craving or strong desire to urge, failure or fulfillment, failure to fulfill major roles at work, school, or home, persistent social or interpersonal problems caused by the substance abuse. Uh, social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced. Use in physically hazardous situations. Use despite physical or psychological problems called by use, caused by use, tolerance, or withdrawal. Um, one of the things that was removed when they reorganized this is any kind of legal problem. That used to be one of the criteria, but you don't have to have trouble with the law for this to be a, a, di a diagnostic criteria. Uh, that's just another reframing of that. So substance use disorder, you need a minimum of two of the 11 symptoms to diagnose it. Two to three symptoms are mild, four to five moderate, six or more severe. And substance induced disorders, things that happen that are reversible, that are a cause of using the substance. They're intoxicated, withdrawal, you can have a psychotic disorder, you can end up with a bipolar disorder because of it, or depression, anxiety, sleep disorder, delirium, neurocognitive problems, permanent damage because of alcohol use, for instance, and sexual dysfunction. I wanted to run through this real quick. Um, this is for our uh, more of a psychosocial model. So the stages of change, Pre-contemplative, contemplative, you're not even thinking about quitting. You're thinking about quitting. You're contemplating quitting. You're planning on it. You actually do it. You stay, you stay sober. And then either you make a change or, more typically, you relapse. And you go through the cycle. And relapse is expected. It's a chronic, recurring, addictive problem. Uh, okay. The clinical picture of intoxication really depends on what you're doing, how much, and how often. Seems self-evident. Um, the route you're going to administer it, how long you've been doing it, when you last did it. And again, withdrawal. Specific, sub this is again more from the DSM-5. Specific substance-induced syndrome that's reversible, physiologic and cognitive components, um, causing stress, not due to another medical condition. Um, okay. Oh, I, there aren't any withdrawal symptoms, for most generally from PCP or hallucinogens or the inhalants. You can have permanent sequelae from that, but there's no acute withdrawal syndrome from it. Uh, substance abuse, mental disorders, potentially severe, potentially lifelong, usually temporary. Uh, again, depends on how much, how often, and what, and can be due to any of the 10 classes of the substances. Again, more on the line of substance abuse, mental disorder, it's evident, you can see it by history, you can see it, you can measure it, um, or you can uh, get it on physical exam. It, it cannot be pre-existing. Neuro, neuro adaptation. So pharmacokinetic adaptation, adaptation of your ability to metabolize. The easiest example is al good alcoholics will metabolize alcohol faster than bad alcoholics or people who are sober. And the ability of the central nervous system to function despite higher blood levels, people can be absolutely, up here, absolutely rock sober with blood alcohol levels in two or three hundred. Oh, so I'll ask, what's the highest alcohol level anybody's seen? 
because we're all in the same field. 500? 700. 700? 900. It's just not dead. Um, tolerance, just definitionally, uh, need to use an increased amount of substance in order to achieve the desired effect or markedly diminished effect with, at the same dosing. Oh, the prevalence of the problem. 22 million people 12 years or old have substance-related disorders. 15 million of them are, have alcohol dependence. They start at an early age, typically less than 15. Oh, sorry, if you start at an early age less than 15, you're more likely to become addicted um, than if you start at 18 years or older. Rates of abuse vary by age, the very young and the very old, typically not. The cluster in the middle. Higher prevalence of abuse in men, American Indians, whites, unemployed, big cities, and the incarcerated or uh, recently released. It's a huge problem. As you, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir, but it is a huge problem. Um, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent at any given time in the emergency department every single day, someone is there because they are actively intoxicated or the sequelae of being intoxicated or an injury because of use. It's, it's, it's huge. Uh, our surgical colleagues, your floors have to be a third full of, of, of folks like this. Um, 13 million people require treatment for alcohol, 5, min, five million for drug use. Uh, a problem we all participate in, uh, the growing use of prescription medication, abuse of prescription medications. It's huge. I saw a doctor tangent here, um, Dr. Drew, who I only knew him as part of a comedy routine, right? I didn't know, he's a real doc, does a real practice, does real good work. So one of the thing that stuck with me when I talked with him was, we write enough Vicodin to get everybody in the country Vicodin, a tablet of Vicodin every four hours for a month. Heroin is on the upstroke because we, because <laughs> we have so many people addicted to opiates that prescription opiates are now just too expensive to get and heroin is simply cheaper. So 40% of hospital admissions have alcohol and drugs associated, 25% of all hospital deaths, 100,000 deaths a year due to it. Um, intoxication is associated with half of all motor vehicle accidents, half of all domestic viol violence cases, and half of all murders. It is pervasive, ubiquitous, epidemic, pandemic. ER visits, we're flooded. Um, we're flooded. And, and we just push them to you. Comorbid, comorbidities, half of all addicts have comorbid psychiatric problems. That is not surprising. And trying to treat one without treating the other doesn't, just doesn't work. Um, typical course of presentation of folks with substance abuse, they are acutely intoxicated, they're in withdrawal, they have mood or, or their psychological problems. Um, become more pre more prevalent. I think the important part is at the bottom, and it was on the, the cycle slide also. Eventually, if we catch them, if we care for them, 70% are eventually able to abstain or decrease their use to drop out of a substance abuse disorder definition. Doesn't mean they're sober all the time, doesn't mean they're abstinent all the time, but they followed up criteria for an abuse disorder. 70%, that, see, that, that is not intuitive. So options for where, for where to treat. Hospitalization due to the acute phase or the acute withdrawal syndrome or the acute substance-induced disorder. After that, residential treatment is an option. Um, social detox is an option. Uh, given the insurance world as it is, most folks end up into intensive outpatient treatment initially. Insurance companies don't like to pay for residential treatment, and frankly, it's not really necessary for everybody. <coughs> Management, treat the intoxication, 
uh, the range of it, treat the detox, either as a social default detox, a brief inpatient monitored detox, and I think it's West Pines up here still, isn't it? Is the, is the only one we've got. And then Arapahoe House is, um, is basically for the metro area. The Ark is here in Boulder. Um, I forget the one up in Greeley. But there aren't, there are, social detox, have, tangent, how many have been to the, re, the, to the neighborhood social detox? Show hands. Go. Really? It, no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, I mean as a visit to go see the place. Not, not there, you know, because you kind of got cost. I'm sorry. Go. There, there, it's, uh, it is barely functional. And so when you send someone there, it's really important to have an idea about what life is really like there. It's three hots and a cot with people who are really sacrificing to help bring these people to detox them and it is at times just a mess. Um, but that's where the bulk of this happens. Right? And they and the burden the societal burden of this flows to the metro wide Arapahoe system or the Ark or Crossroads in Pueblo. It, it's be very empathetic when you're on the phone with these places because they're working just as hard as you all are to take care of a population that really is very difficult and often very ungrateful for your care. Yes? Is there a difference between uh, people overcoming their addiction in inpatient versus outpatient treatment? The question is, is there a difference in people overcoming their addiction inpatient versus outpatient treatment? Do you, need, do you mean medical inpatient and outpatient, or uh, alcohol detox treatment inpatient outpatient? Uh, like a rehab center, inpatient rehab versus outpatient rehab. I think, I think it's a continuum of care. Some of the folks that are inpatient in rehab simply have greater resources, or may have had a more, uh, more severe disease, got caught, took the involuntary route in. But it, it's, that is a population, that Venn diagram overlaps considerably. There are a number of, for our social uh, work and psychological folks, um, there are a number of different styles of intervention. I'm not aware that anyone is clearly more superior over the others. As long as you're in it, you stay in it, and you've got somebody holding your toes to the fire. Um, medication assisted treatment is present but limited you treat the, the emotional disorders as best you can the direct treatment of substance with medication assisted treatment varies depending on the substance and there aren't really a whole lot of choices um, half again half of uh, people with substance use disorders have a co-occurring psychiatric disorders, and you always have to treat the medical associated conditions. I think I want to take a tangent here. This is where I wanted the tangent. <laughs> so, the broad way to think about this, because we have substance abuse, and, but this is one we know, we already know that they've got that. But when they come in, the 14 year old, whose postural tachycardia, um, disorganized, has cognitive impairment, sudden onset, um, physiologically impaired, that category of patient is delirium. And if you want to think broadly about the, this group of which drug and alcohol induced syndromes reside, it's delirium, right? And, 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 the, and the, that pleomorphic medical approach to delirium is how you have to, it is objective number two, medication overlapping substance abuse, the category is delirium. So let's, let's just run through that a little bit. It is a disorder of consciousness, it's a disorder of cognition, and it's a disorder of perception. It's fluctuating, 
It is sudden in onset, it's treatable, and it's reversible. There may be permanent sequelae, right? If you've, drink, if you've drunk alcohol for 40 years, your neurons are not coming back. They'll get better. But you can still have permanent disability from that. So about a quarter of the folks who have delirium have increased activity. About a quarter of the folks who have delirium have decreased activity. About a third fluctuate between the two. And a sixth, the rest of them, sit there quietly. We used to have, a, this whole field has language issues. How we talk about it is really important. And the language has changed over time. And the language for medicine is slightly different than the language for social. For social work is slightly different than the language that our um, psychologists use. It's overlapping. But we used to have uh, an approach to it called functional and organic. And that lingers on. It's helpful. It's mildly helpful. Organic disease, there's a problem with the organ. Functional disease, there's a problem with how it functions. Now, we know that there are organic roots to many of the emotional disorders, right? Depression, it's both functional and it's organic. This card deck that I have that you don't have is in the update that you can get. That you can get. Um, so delirium, it's organic disease, it's a disturbance of consciousness, impaired attention, there are illusions or misinterpretations present, sudden in onset, a fluctuating course throughout the day, um, psychomotor activity, and they may have visual, not auditory hallucinations, right? Auditory hallucinations more um, psychiatric based, again, overlapping problems, but and visual disorders more delirium based. So to think broadly, when you think about delirium, what's my time? I have 17, oh that's awesome. So you think broadly about uh, delirium, drug abuse and drug withdrawal, electrolyte disorders, endocrine disorders, diabetes, toxidromes, liver disease, um, infections, hypoxia, CNS lesions, strokes, bleeds. Um, medicines. Almost every category of medicine can end up with delirium. If you're on more than three medicines, if you've changed more than three medicines, if you stop them, if you start them, you can get delirious. You can become delirious, the elderly in particular, just by changing locations, right? We try to, in the emergency department, we try to keep the elderly out of the hospital, even if that medically is the best place for them, because we put them in the hospital, they become really delirious, and that 25% of them, that is a, so let me rephrase that, there's a 25% mortality to delirium in the elderly. So sometimes, it's better to send them back home with less care. So anticholinergics, anticonvulsants, antidepressants, phenothiazines, beta blockers, digoxin, diuretics, SSRIs, lithium, benzos, sedatives, thyroid medicines, sympathomimetics, antidiarrheals, antiemetics. There's hardly a category that when used can't lead to delirium. So again, Draw substance abuse is part of the larger category of delirium. Um, the sing one of the single most important thing. Yeah, well, let me back up. Let me back up. So I'm an emergency medicine doc, which means I've been raised by nurses. <laughs> so when it is, I've been raised by nurses. I've been trained or challenged into a collaborative practice at all times. <laughs> it's just the way it works in the pit, right? It's just the way it works. So um, you all spend much more time with patients than me and my brethren do. And so really investigating this, 
um, is much easier for you. You develop significant relationships with your clients, and you're in the position really to ferret this out and to direct them much more than I am by far. And let's just recognize that at the beginning. So the most important thing that you can do is ask. Just ask. So if you want to study the effect of asking, if you ask somebody, are you doing drugs? Are you drinking? And whatever, right? Just those questions. People will self-report 92% sensitive, 91% specific, 94% negative predictive value, and an 88% positive predictive value for free. It costs nothing to ask, and there is there. There may not be a better test with specificity, sensitivity, negative predictive value. Just ask this group. They will tell us. And particularly you, because you end up having a real personal relationship with your patients. I see them for an hour, maybe. They may be in the emergency department two, three, four, five hours, but you're the ones that have that can really have the impact here. So the workup. Um, there's no mystery here, there's no real magic. It's basic medicine, right? Blood and urine tox screens, CHEM 7, liver function test, coag studies, TSH, maybe a CAT scan, probably a CAT scan. Sometimes an LP. That's it. And then a history taking, and then asking. There, there, there's no magic, there's no magic here. It's just basic fundamental medicine. Okay, we're gonna skip. I was gonna run through a bunch of toxidromes, but it's the same process. There is huge overlap between anticholinergic toxidromes or lithium toxicity or the late stages of Tylenol toxicity or the mid stages of aspirin toxicity. They all can look the same. So an acute methamphetamine overdose looks the same as an as thyrotoxicosis, looks the same as mania, can look the same as schizophrenia. And the, in the history is physical exam and the basic lab work. But the overlap is huge. The overlap, it could look, uh, di throw diabetes in there really at any point in time. So alcohol, probably uh, outside of tobacco, the most prevalent substance we have. Um, anything over uh, 80 milligrams percent considered intoxicated, usually 40% if, if you're the one is impaired. Um, the gamut of euphoria to intubation. So withdrawal early, anxious. Everybody's familiar with, anybody not familiar with the COI score? 10 minutes, thank you. Um, so alcohol withdrawal is dangerous. Alcohol and benzodiazepine withdrawal is dangerous. And they need to be treated with benzodiazepines. Um, see what score, I'm gonna, just gonna cruise through this. We use benzodiazepines and anticonvulsants to treat withdrawal. Think about thiamine supplementation if, because of Wernicke Korsakoff. Uh, three really approaches to treatment of that. Medication is disulfiram, antabuse, punish you for drinking. Uh, Camprol helps with desire, and Vivitrol, now Trexone, either orally or long-acting, really pretty good for alcohol and opiates to help with the cravings. We have a booming program at Arapahoe House for this. Um, again, okay, so antabuse punishment, naltrexone uh, works on the front end. Risky use, again, definitional problems. Um, the difference between risky use and unhealthy use is a spectrum. Uh, I want to get to, oh, here, this is it. Screening tests. Ask. Just ask. It's 82% uh, sensitive, 79% specific for unhealthy. It's a lousy screening test in some ways. Um, if you're screening for cancer, that's a lousy screening test. If you're screening for alcohol abuse, just ask. 
Is everybody comfortable with the difference between sensitive and specific? Sensitive. Um, do you have a uterus? Do you have a prostate? 100% sensitive for pregnancy. 1% specific. 100% sensitive for prostate cancer. 1% specific. There's a longer audit C screening for, um, this is more for primary care practice. For us in the hospital based, just ask. Same thing with drug and alcohol screening, just ask. How many times in the past year have you had four, five, uh, five, four for women or more drinks in one day? Any positive answer is a positive screen, which allows you then to have the conversation. Or for primary care screening, or perhaps on the floors, internal medicine, and when you've got time, um, it's a longer questionnaire, you get to score it. Three questions, cage questions, generally falling out of favor. Uh, alcohol screening for adolescents, huge. Drugs and alcohol, the, re um, the recommendation is to start questioning at 11. 11. Did I see a hand? Um, and it, again, how many in the, in the past year, on how many days have you had more than a few sips of beer, wine, or any drink containing alcohol? If your friends drink, how many drinks do they usually drink on an occasion? The other one I would toss in, have you ever been concerned about being in the car with your parents? It's a screening exam. Ask. Uh, the full audit screen, uh, cumbersome. Alcohol for kids. Have you ever gotten a car driven by someone who is high or been using? Do you ever use drugs or alcohol to relax? Do you ever use drugs or alcohol while you're alone? Do you ever forget things when you've been using? Do your friends use? Have you ever gotten into trouble? Again, just ask. Score greater than two is considered positive with a huge specificity for abuse. So the American Association of Pediatrics um, recommends starting screening at 11. Early initiation of this discussion is suggested because children begin to view alcohol and probably in Colorado, marijuana, positively between the ages of nine and 13 years of age, given the frequent exposure to alcohol advertising because it's so common. Ask. So I, I read this and I started feeling guilty. We go, to, we go on vacation. I give my kids a sip of my Kahlua and cream. What have I just done? They see me drinking it. I now have defined it as an adult activity, and I have defined it as something pleasurable. I don't have an answer. 19% um, report having their first drink of alcohol, more than a few sips, before they were 13. 9% report having smoked a whole cigarette before they were 13, and 9% report having tried marijuana before they're 13. We start our kids young. Thank you. Benzos. The, the one thing I want to communicate about benzodiazepines every, is I wish I, could, could, I wish I could give you the med list of people that come into detox. Everybody that comes into detox, I get to review their medications, and that's like 20,000 a year in Arapaho House. So folks who are coming in for methamphetamine use or alcohol withdrawal are on two and sometimes three benzodiazepines, three and four antidepressants. So in your review of medications, right? In your review of medications, um, whether you're in the hospital setting or a primary care setting or wherever, if some doc is writing for two benzos, there should be a conversation now, right? Are you sure that we should be treating the anxiety with month-to-month -month doses of benzodiazepines? Is there another, is there a more appropriate baseline medication, well, butrin, effects, or something, to manage that rather than episodic management? And certainly no one should ever be treating seizures with benzos. Um, Benzos are incredibly dangerous, incredibly addictive, and getting off of them takes a long, long, long time. 
that metabolize slightly different opiates. I participate, me personally, participate in the intoxication of the entire country because I'm the emergency medicine doc and people come in for pain and patient satisfaction surveys say you should get a pillow and a Percocet when you leave. <laughs> so, on, my, on the other end, at Arapalos, I, I treat these folks. Opiate withdrawal is not dangerous. It is messy, it is miserable, and it is memorable. It's not particularly dangerous, but it is particularly addicting. Um, outpatient treatment methadone, substitution, buprenorphine, suboxone, substitution, naltrexone, whether orally or long term, um, helps with cravings. There really are limited clubs in the bag for this. Stimulants, they can overlap. Stimulants overlap with um, cocaine, did not go away. Stimulants, methamphetamines, cocaine, uh, sympathomimetics look like thyrotoxicosis, look like mania, look like schizophrenia. Keep a broad differential. Everything, just because it looks like a duck does not mean it's a duck. Um, you, I'm just going to buzz through here. So, um, the kiddo, we'll just take questions for a minute. The kiddo that comes in, 14, tachycardic, normotensive, postural tachycardia, wide eyes, nystagmus, horizontal, and interesting, rotatory. Hardly ever get to see that. Not sick, no fevers, not short of breath, no cough, no belly pain. Can walk, but not very well, non-lateralizing neurologic exam. Both arms and legs work, but they don't coordinate well. How many of these substances, oh, let's go back. Of the 10 categories, how many substances could that be? It right, turns out, well, let's go. Let's, um, could be alcohol, could be. Could be any of the stimulants. Could be any of the antidepressants, could be caffeine. He could have consumed huge amounts of monster. Uh, I'm getting close, there we go. Um, hallucinogens, and eh, probably not, but could be. One minute. Benadryl. Anticholinergic poisoning. That looks just like half of these. I have to stop. Questions? Yes. Can you talk, I know you have eight minutes, but on the prevalence of abuse amongst healthcare workers? The, st the studies that I, thank you, the studies that I'm aware of is we are no different than the general population. Our abuse rates are the same. Don't change because we're in healthcare or poor if we're not. We abuse at the same rate. So 8% of us have a substance abuse disorder with alcohol, 5% or 2% have a substance abuse disorder with other substances. We have access. And so I think the, the internal skewing is a little different when you lump other substances. I think the internal skewing is different towards opiates, but alcohol remains the same. Yeah. So I, I, I saw in the news this uh, coach that got um, got fired for being drunk, and he's suing his employer for the disability. He says for his alcoholism is a disability. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it, but um, I don't know that particular case. Uh, given our society, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I, I don't know that. Uh, I drink because. I, I go to a stressful job, and so it's your fault. That, that sounds like an addictive personality. 